Now, in all these talks about the properties of matter, I've been talking about atoms and molecules. I have to, because atoms and molecules are the building stones of which matter is made. And if we're to understand the way uh, property, uh, bodies acquire their properties and why they work, we must talk about it in terms of these building units. These atoms and molecules, why do I always link them together? Well, these small bodies of which matter is made are of two kinds, simple and complex. The simple units are the atoms themselves. They're the atoms of the elements of which we know 90 odd, like oxygen or sulfur or copper. They're small bodies, all exactly the same and a body like copper is built up of these atoms. Far more commonly, these atoms are grouped together in little family parties. Several atoms of different kinds unite together and make an absolutely definite structure. It's rather like the game of happy families, a sort of Mr. Atom, Mrs. Atom, Master Atom, and Miss Atom all stick together as a family. And of course, they can be larger and more complex than that. It was Dalton who first of all showed that you would explain the way bodies combine together by talking about these molecules. Uh, here, for instance, is a model which represents a sugar molecule, a group or family party of atoms. These white ones here represent the hydrogen atoms, these black ones the carbon atoms, and these red ones the oxygen atoms. And all molecules of this particular type of sugar, what we call cane sugar, are exactly like this. These are the identical building stones of the substance we call sugar. Here is another molecule, this thing which looks rather like a caterpillar, is one in which there are hydrogen and carbon atoms all along its body, so to speak. And in the particular type I'm trying to represent here, which might be an oil or something of that kind, at one end of this chain there's an active group, a group represented by this red atom here. So here again is another molecule. And the point is that we talk of atoms and molecules as the building stones of matter, we must remember the atoms are the simple ones, all exactly alike, that build up the elements. The molecules are also the fundamental building stones, but they are the building stones of a far larger class of compounds made by family parties of atoms held together by chemical bonds, as in this model here. Now, uh, these, then, are examples which show the difference between the atom and the molecule. Remember that always, the atom the simple thing, the molecule the little family party, but both are alike in that any one compound body, which is pure, is built up of units exactly the same kind, uh, like the simple atom or one of these things. Now, I want to try and make you realize that these atoms and molecules are real things. Why is it so difficult to do so? It's because they're so very small. The very fine to have a model of sugar like this, but we must remember that the distance between two atoms in such a model is about a hundred millionth of an inch, a very small amount indeed. And it's difficult to imagine anything on that scale. For ordinary measurements, we use, say, a centimetre ruler, with divided into centimetres. Now, if we wanted a little ruler to measure up molecules, it would have to be divided into hundred millionths of a centimetre. And that would be a convenient scale to use for our measurements. And to make it easier to try and comprehend anything as small as this, I want to show you that it's really not as bad as it looks at first sight. To do it, I'm going to use a kind of ladder of size, a scale of size. Here now is my scale. It starts with one at the top, something, say, an inch across, something you can easily see and handle. 
10 to the minus 1 means 1 tenth of that size, 1 over 10. 10 to the minus 2 is 1 over 100, 1 over 2 tens multiplying each other. 10 to the minus 3, 1 over 1,000, and so on, until that's 1 over 100 million. Now, what I'm going to show is this. If we have a scale like that, we can quite easily picture Think of it as a kind of ladder. We're going down it rung by rung. It's quite easy to climb down these first few rungs, three or four of them, by objects we know in ordinary life. And if only we go on climbing down a few more rungs, we only have to do eight rungs in all before we get down to the atom. So you see, it's, it's nearer things that we're accustomed to than you might think. Well, let's start our climb. I've got our climb down, I should say. Here I've got two crystals of sugar, rather fine crystals. They'll do for the start of our scale. Uh, because they're inch or so across, they can represent number one on the scales we set up. And here we've got coffee sugar. These crystals, these are the kind one uses on rather grand occasions for coffee. And they're rather convenient because in going from there to there, we go down just about one rung of the ladder. These are about a tenth as large each way as these crystals with which we started. And conveniently again, we go from here to here to soft sugar. These little crystals of soft sugar are about one tenth of the size of the coffee sugar crystals. And in the next stage, perhaps, we might take icing sugar. Already, the crystals are getting so tiny there that if I'm to see them, I must look at them like this through a lens. So there we have the first three steps of our ladder from this kind of sugar, these rather rare big crystals, this that you're very accustomed to. This is the kind of coffee sugar, uh, which is exactly, almost exactly one-tenth the size of those. Here is the soft sugar, which we use so much in the home, a tenth of that again, and here is icing sugar, a tenth of that again. So you see, we can go down quite painlessly these first rungs, uh, starting with our big sugar crystal. There's the coffee. Now these others are almost too small to stick on, but, uh, but uh, soft sugar would look rather like that. And uh, icing sugar, I expect a little dot like that, which I expect you could hardly see. But there is something familiar. Now, already, when we get down to the size of icing sugar, it's very hard to see the little crystals of it. So, when we look at an object like that, what we generally do is to look at it with a lens. If I take this lens and look at my icing sugar, I can actually see the individual little crystals of it. So opposite this, I'll put the thing we have to use to see it. And I'll put lens there, representing uh, looking at something about that 10 to the minus 3 size. If anything gets smaller than that, we've really got to use a microscope. A lens fails us. When we go down to the next rung of the ladder, about 10 to the minus 4, it is almost impossible to see it with a lens. And so we use a microscope. It was a great discovery uh, made in the 1600s that one could, by combining lenses, get an instrument that enabled one to magnify things as greatly as a microscope does. Hooke was one of the great people in this country to examine various bodies with a microscope. And the first slide I'm going to show you is one of Hooke's famous drawings of what he saw through his microscope. You may recognize it. It's the drawing of a flea. It's only with a microscope that one can see fine details like those bristles on the flea's tail or the spikes on its legs. So I'll put down flea about this position here, 10 to the minus 4, and say if we look at that properly, we must use our microscope. Now, a microscope will do better than that. The next slide I'm going to show you is a very fine 
piece of microscope work indeed. The microscope is looking at bacteria. And bacteria are done on this scale, in the sort of 10 to the minus 5 region, a little bit higher, perhaps, than 10 to the minus 5 itself. And my next slide shows some bacteria looked at through a microscope. Now, what I want you to notice is this. This is a very good microscope, and a very good man used it. And yet, you cannot see details of the bacteria. They're a little bit fuzzy. Look at the edges of those blobs there on the slide. If you see this one here, for instance, this little pair of bacteria up there, you will see that just, they're like two fuzzy bodies meeting together. Now, we cannot get round that and see the detail by using better microscopes. That's as good as a microscope will do, and I'll explain why. A microscope uses light to get its effects. Light consists of waves. It's light waves that are, as it were, drawing the picture of the microbe the bacteria. And light cannot draw any details finer than the wavelength of light. Light is, as it were, a pencil with which we're drawing the shape of the bacteria. And if you were to draw a picture, the pencil must be finer than the actual details of the picture. For instance, suppose I want to sign my name. I'm perfectly happy with this little brush here because I'm going to make my signature much larger than the brush. And I can write my name on here. That's when a light wave is smaller than the object. And it then will show it quite clearly. But suppose the object was so very small that it was actually a good deal smaller than a wavelength of light. And now, you see, it is very difficult to write one's signature on the same scale. Here now is my wavelength of light, much bigger than the object, W L Bragg. That's our fuzzy microbe, you see. That's why light was beaten in the microscope and couldn't show the details. If I just look at my slide again, uh, in this slide, I've drawn at the bottom some light waves at the same scale as the bacteria. And if you notice, uh, look at the scale of these light waves, it's just about the same as the scale of fuzziness of the microbes. So, for a long time, it was believed that we never get any further. It was obvious that light couldn't help us anymore. But in the last 30 years or so, a wonderful new instrument has been developed, called, which you may have heard of, called the electron microscope. And the electron microscope enables us to go some nearly three further rungs down the ladder of, sc of scale. In the electron microscope, instead of using light scattered by the body to make an image, electrons are scattered by the body. These electrons are focused not by a glass lens as in a microscope, but by a magnetic lens, a magnetic field bends the electrons round. And in that way, one can get clear-cut images of very small bodies indeed. For instance, my next slide shows bodies of the bacteria size. Actually, these are sperm uh, cells, uh, the male element which unites with the female element in fertilization. If you look at these sperms with their long tails that they use to wriggle along, you'll see the detail is very much better than anything you could possibly get with a microscope. And the electron microscope can go a good deal further. There are very small bodies called viruses. They've never been seen before. You can't, they're so small that they go through filters and you cannot possibly see them with a microscope. Yet many diseases are obviously caused by some sort of extremely small body, and that body got the name of a virus. With the electron microscope, we can see the virus. Uh, my next slide here shows a cluster of these virus particles. Uh, they're very regular little bodies, so regular that they crystallize, as it were. They come together in a regular array, like the molecules in a crystal. So now, that we've got the electron microscope, we can see the virus, and 
even go further still, the next slide shows a single virus particle. You see it looks rather like a little blackberry or raspberry, a cluster of blobs. And actually, this is a fascinating thing, each of those blobs is a molecule. It's true it's a vast molecule with very many thousands of atoms in it, but it's a molecule for all that. So we can see, if we're allowed to call it seeing with an electron microscope, we can actually see a large molecule. And there the electron microscope packs up. It won't take us to the next stage. The next stage is reached by a kind of research that I've been doing all my life, uh, the investigating bodies with X-rays. X-rays are very fine waves indeed, far shorter than light, and by seeing how bodies scatter X-rays, one can argue back to the way the atoms are arranged in these bodies. We do it by means of a crystal structure. And so I'll put crystal structure there, and I'll put X-rays for examining the crystal structure, and say that with these X-rays we can actually see how the atoms in the body are arranged. For instance, this molecule of sugar to which I've referred before with its hydrogen, black carbon and red oxygen atoms was worked out by X-rays. It's a map of how this molecule is built up. So we've gone the whole way down now. We've started off with a large crystal of sugar which is a regular array of molecules. We've gone right down till we see what the molecule itself is like. Well, to end with, I want to show two experiments, very well-known experiments, which I always, to me, make molecules seem much more real. The first of these experiments was done, done by the great Lord Rayleigh. And he, for the first time, got an idea of the actual size of a molecule. In those days, Dalton's theory that atoms joined together to form molecules had been accepted, but of course nobody knew how big those molecules were. Well, Rayleigh argued in this way. It was known, if you put a quite a minute drop of oil on water, it spread over the water. It made a film on the water. And Rayleigh guessed, and he was quite right, that this oil spreads out over the water until it forms what's called a monomolecular film. That is to say, the oil molecules all sit on the water side by side and in a pack, a kind of raft of oil molecules. So the thickness of this film is one molecule thick. Actually, it's two molecules thick, but Rayleigh was very near it in his guess that it was one. Now, Rayleigh argued in this way, if I know the size of my drop and I measure how much it spreads over the water, because the volume of the drop is the same as the volume of the sheet, I can, of course, calculate the thickness of that sheet. And I'll illustrate now the way he did his experiment. I'll do it first in a simpler way. I've got a dish here which I've been very careful to keep clean, and some water that I've been very careful to keep clean, because this must be done with absolutely clean water. And I shall pour water into this dish. Just cover the bottom of the dish. No, I scatter some very fine powder. It's actually like a podium powder, fern seed powder, and it rests on the surface of the water. There's a little layer on the water, which I hope you can see. I shall now put a minute quantity of grease on the surface of that water. I can easily do it by rubbing my ballpoint pin over my nose. And I hope you will see, suddenly the oil spreads over the water and drives out the lycopodium powder. And we can measure the area which has driven it out, that's the area of our oil film. That isn't actually the way in which Rayleigh did it. He found out how far the oil had gone by what's called the camphor movements. If again I take a perfectly clean dish like this one, pour my clean water on it, and take a piece of camphor and scatter some little bits of camphor on the water. Now I want you to watch these little bits of camphor all dart about on the water as though they were tiny fish. 
The reason is one which we'll go into a bit more in another talk. It's surface tension. The camphor dissolves more on one side than the other, weakens the surface tension of the water on one side, and the stronger surface tension on the other pulls it away. Now, the more it's pulled away, the more it's going into clean water and leaving soiled water in its wake. So, of course, it goes on and on and on. But if we just put an oil film over that water, which I'm doing here now, you'll see it will kill all these little fellows dead because the oil spreads and no longer gives this surface tension effect. So Rayleigh measured his uh, extent to which the oil had spread by noticing how far out the little camphor particles were killed. They stopped their motion when he put this little bit of oil on the water. In that way, he got the length of one of these oil molecules, which all sit by side by side, as 50 of these 10 to the minus 8 units. Actually, the molecule is 25 long. What he didn't realize was these sit in two layers, one on top of the other. But it was so nearly right that it was a very great experiment indeed. Uh, my final experiment is one that always seems to me to make molecules very real indeed. Uh, we've seen in a gas, a gas consists of molecules dashing about in all directions, hitting the sides of the vessel. Now, we can't see those molecules, we can't see their motion. But we can do this experiment. It was first noticed by a man called Brown, a scientist called Brown, that if you look at very small particles indeed in suspension in a liquid, they seem to be dashing about in all directions. That's because they're being bombarded by the molecules of the gas. Picture a passenger on a railway station with a lot of extremely rude children dashing about in all directions and not knowing where they were going. If those children bumped against the railway engine, they wouldn't make much difference. But if they bump against the passenger, because they're not looking where they're going, he will sort of not be knocked about slightly by these bumps coming first from one side and then from another. The interesting thing is that we can put particles so fine into a gas that although they're still big enough for us to see them, they're small enough to be knocked about like the passenger on the railway station is by these rude children bumping into him. This man Brown noticed this movement. It's always been called the Brownian movement. To illustrate how it comes about, we'll go back to our kinetic model here in which we've got these little beads to be the molecules of a gas, I'll hang the body. This is our very small body in that. And now if we warm that up, you will see, I'll just get it quite quiet first, right? If we warm it up, you will see that more please to a gas. Right. Well, now, here is the real thing. We've got in the field of view of this microscope a number of very fine particles uh, of graphite in a dilute uh, solution uh, of, of some kind of lubricant. They're small enough to show the Brownian movement. And if I look through the microscope, I can see them dashing about in all directions and right and left and up and down, and also ascending and descending in the liquid so that they come into focus and out of focus again. So these then are these motions which Brown was the first to observe, and to my mind, this experiment, actually seeing these little particles knocked about in all directions like this, is one of the most direct proofs that we've really got molecules dashing about in all directions in a gas or a liquid.